See, over the last few weeks, we've been in this series, and as we've seen, Malachi brings about a series of disputes between God and his people. Questions brought up from the different people about who God is, questioning his character, questioning if he's real. And yet, through all of these disputes, six in total, in each response, we see God's heart for his people to redeem, to restore, and renew. To redeem, to restore, and to renew. See, as we'll see tonight in Malachi's final words and as he closes out the Old Testament and calls God's people to trust him once more, he's inviting them. He's inviting them to partner with him. And not just in a way where, where he does all the work, but in a way where he says together, we're gonna see the renewal of, of the things that I've promised you. I mean, you're gonna see the renewal of God's work in your life, the renewal of God's work in your family, in your city, in your community, as you trust me. And so Malachi can be hard to follow sometimes. And I'm gonna do my best tonight to make it not as difficult to understand. That's my job as a kids pastor sometimes. You take all these complex ideas and you simplify them. And no, we, I don't always use puppets to do it, although some people think, everyone I talk to, they're like, oh, you're a kids pastor? Do you do puppets? I'm like, no, no, I don't do puppets. Maybe, maybe I'm gonna do puppets. James is gonna make me do puppets from now on. Could you imagine? That's actually why I wanted the headset tonight, so I could do puppets for you guys. Dance. All right, well, I'm going to invite you to stand as we read the passage for tonight. We're going to be starting in Malachi 3, verse 13. Malachi 3, verse 13, it says this. You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what is it that we have said against you? You have said it is futile. It is vain to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirement and going about like mourners? before the Lord Almighty. But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper, and even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. As a New Living Translation states in verse 14, what have we gained by obeying his commands or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? For those who dare God to punish them suffer no harm. For those who dare God to punish them, suffer no harm. What have we gained? You can grab a seat. Perhaps you've asked this question before. What do I gain by following Jesus? What do I gain by giving my life to him? Is there any worth when I see those around me, those who go against his character, be blessed? For those who dare to punish, dare God to punish them, suffer no harm. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go into it tonight. God, I thank you for this time. God, I thank you for the minutes and the moments that we have together. God, I just pray that, God, it would be your will and your way tonight. God, I'm believing that you want to do something special in the room. You want to do something special in this place. And so, God, would you, would you help us to, to focus in on what your spirit is saying God, would your spirit speak through me? Would it be not my words, but yours? Not led by my own thoughts or, or my will or, or my way, but God, by yours. And so God, I just pray that you would fill this room tonight, that this room would be filled with your presence. And God, we would draw closer to you, that we would encounter and experience the living God who is here in this room tonight. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. amen. All right, Teila, have you, have you ever questioned God? Have you ever questioned God? And I don't mean in the sense where it's like, oh God, why is there no Chick-fil-A here in Calgary? I know you've asked that question before, or why that shorty or that friend won't look at you or pay attention to you. I know you've asked that as well. I feel like we all have. There, there, there's some questions that I feel like, you know, per, pertain to every single one of us in this room. God, why did you create gluten-free? Why couldn't it just all be free and great? That's a question I personally have asked. Any other gluten-free people in the room? 
Oh my goodness, I am alone. All right, thank you, Daryl. Even though you're not celiac, are you celiac? No, you just ask God just because you're wondering and you're curious. You're like, God, why? I see Seb's life. Why did you create gluten? Why does he have to suffer so much? Wow, that's actually sad. Out of so many people, it's just me. Nobody's celiac. Okay, one, come on, don't be afraid. No shame in the room. Come on, be loud and proud. I am a celiac. So if you give me something, I might say no. Don't come to my house because you're going to get uh, crusty, old, brittle cupcakes. All right. I know there's questions we all ask, but I mean in the sense that perhaps you've questioned the validity of God, his goodness, his faithfulness, his sureness. God, are, are, are you real? God, why why is this happening? Perhaps these questions come to mind even today and this week as you look around and you see the state of our world, the images of injustice flashing across our screens, both on our phones and on TV, the reports of division as wars and protests break out all over the world, close to home and far away the stories of hardship and heartache that overwhelm us, all this information available at an instant, being thrown at us at an unprecedented rate in a way that human history has never experienced or seen before. And yet, it doesn't end there. It can also be overwhelming at home, in our school, in our community, in ourselves, we, we strive and, and, and we seek to, to honor God, to, to live a life that is honorable, and we become hardened by the reality that life isn't easy. God, why is it that as I seek to honor you, to obey you, that I'm worse off, anxious, heartbroken, disappointed, while my other friends, those who don't honor you, those who go against your character, they lie, they cheat, they steal, they seem to be better off. They seem to be happier. They seem to not worry as much. Perhaps you've questioned God before. If you have, then you join me. And you're not alone. Because the reality is I've asked this question quite a lot as well, even lately. You look around, there's so much division and there's so much brokenness, there's so much hardship and heartache and, and you begin to, to be bogged down by these things and you begin to question. And it's the same question that the Israelites asked. They accused. What have we gained? God, what? What have we gained by following you? See, at times, it's as we experience this reality of a, a broken, sinful world that we may find ourselves questioning God. Where is the justice in all of this? Where is your goodness, God? Where are you? And we, we, we've seen it play out all throughout Malachi. Week after week, each of our amazing preachers and teachers have expounded upon these questions that God has responded to. And today, perhaps you relate to this question. God, where, where are you? Where is the good in all of this? There, there, there's a meme I, uh, I saw earlier, I know, what a transition. Come on, God, where are you? There's a meme. And I, I love this meme because I feel like this is what Malachi's been most of the time. It's not spiritual attack. You just make bad choices. I feel like there's been so many moments in Malachi that we've talked about where it's, you know, they're, they're, they're accusing, they're questioning God, and God's like, don't you realize you brought this upon yourself? But this is what I want you to know. 
Our questions in relation to God are not inherently evil, as they're often a natural response to the world around us. Sorry, I laughed as I was going, because I saw some girl just like taking a picture of that meme. She's gonna send it to her friends. She's like, why are you always complaining? Why are you always sad? It's because of you, you do this to yourself. (laughs) See, our questions in relation to God, they're not inherently evil. They're often a natural response to the world around us, to division, to brokenness and hurt. And yet, I want you to know this as well. God is not deterred by your questions. He's not angry because of them. So our questions, they're, they're not inherently evil and, and God isn't angry or, or deterred because of them, but yet know this, Tehillah, we have to be careful. We have to be careful. Careful that our questions don't consume us. Careful that our questions don't consume us that we don't become so preoccupied with our present, with, with the circumstance we find ourselves in, with the situation that we're going through, that we lose perspective. We lose sight of the bigger picture. We lose sight of who God is, and we fail to see or recognize his presence any longer. See, if we're not careful, that's what happens. I've met a lot of friends in my life that have just started with the question. That question was not wrong. God was not afraid of their questions, but they allowed those questions to consume them, and they lost sight of God. They became so preoccupied with the present that they lost perspective. They could no longer see his presence in the midst of what was around them. Let me explain. See, at this point in Malachi, the Israelites had returned from exile. They had seen God's goodness as he had protected his people and kept his promises. The return from exile, the building of the temple as uh, Alyssa so beautifully spoke, spat to last week. (laughs) She did amazing. Uh, She called me out last week. This is my chance to call her out. Actually, she called me out in staff meeting because... Quick side note, this has nothing to do with the sermon. I didn't even realize this was happening. Last week, I was emceeing. Um, I came up. There was a beautiful moment. God was moving, and I, without realizing, started to sing out loud with a mic in my hand. As soon as I got off the stage, I got a text of, hey, man, you were so off key. And I was like, what? You're not even in the room. Where are you? They're like, online? It came through so clearly. And I was so embarrassed. I didn't know Pastor Michael was listening. I was like, this is, I guess, this is my rehearsal. This is my, uh, my chance to, to get in. And I, I failed. I, I didn't know. I, I didn't know it was being recorded. But uh, Alyssa, she was trying to give some Greek words. What? It's being recorded. Come on. And now everyone's going to go back to, yet, to last week's recording, and then they're going to find me. It was rough. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah, I, it was like that. I was like, God. And I didn't know. I was so deep in it. And meanwhile, people online are like, what is wrong with that kid? I, we have no idea. Pray for him, please. In the chat, they're like, hey, pray for the pastor or whoever that guy is. He's struggling right now. They gave me a link to, like, singing lessons or something like that. TCS dance, yeah, 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 or Tequila Creative School, something like that. I was excited because I heard Tequila dance, but we were talking about singing anyways. I could use that as well. Moving on. All right, so here we are. God had protected his people. He kept his promises. They'd returned from exile, the building of the temple, and yet despite them seeing God's goodness and faithfulness, over time, slowly, they became preoccupied with their current circumstances. They began to question God. They accused him. They lost perspective and failed to see God through their situation. They lost faith. What have we gained? What good is it to us to follow Jesus? 
The same people who had just seen the promise of the temple, who had received the promise of, of being protected, returning from exile. These same people that had seen God move in their father's lives, in their mother's lives, in their grandparents' lives, the same people that were experiencing God's presence in that time because they became consumed by their questions, lost sight of God. God, is it worth following you anymore? God, are you good? What have we gained? I just realized I uh, mixed up my notes, so give me a moment. All right. It's there where I'd love for us to turn back to Malachi, where we see God's response to the Israelites, to their words. And he does so this time differently. Whereas every other dispute, every other question that's taken place in Malachi so far, he responds with a statement. He gives a, a, a defense, a, a, re, a rebuttal. This time, he responds with a short story. Any of you guys have those parents or, or friends, teachers, that like when you ask a question, they want to seem all deep and philosophical, and they don't actually answer the question by just giving it to you. They give you a story so that you can find the answer. That ever happened to you? Like sometimes I'll be like, Mom, can I, can I eat this? And she'll be like, I remember when I knew someone that died from eating this. And you're like, okay, so you're telling me no, but you're telling me through a story. You could have just said no. So this, this, this is what God is doing. He, he's responding through a story. He can make it easy for them, but he's giving them imagery and, and he's illustrating this scene so that they would see what would happen if they continued this way, as it reads in Malachi three sixteen to four verse three, or four chapter three, chapter four verse three. All right, then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in His presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored His name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them. Just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Wow. That, see, that was the verse when James was like, all right, I want you to speak on God's renewal, and I read that. I'm like, what is this? Like, what? What? Not a branch, well-fed calves, galloping and frolicking, trampling on the wicked. Um, the arrogant and evil doer will be stubble. I was like, what the heck is stubble? I don't even know what that means. Rise with healing in its rays. You know, have you ever, like, have you ever played that game? Sometimes we do it in kids and youth ministry. It's called Poorly Explained Movies. Anyone in here play that game? No? Okay, some of you. So basically, it works like this. It's like, a, you know, maybe you have an uncle, you have a grandpa, a grandparent that is explaining a movie to you, and when they're explaining it to you, you're like, that makes no sense, yet in somehow, some way, it's actually what it is. So for example, in the, the game, they're like, uh, obsessed father kills half the population with his rock collection. There you go, Thanos, Avengers Endgame. So that was that poorly explained? Like, it wasn't poorly, poorly explained, but you get the, you get the point. You could have just said Thanos, Avengers Endgame. Instead, you just have a weird way of explaining it. That's what this feels like sometimes. It's like this poorly explained, like, story of, like, all these different things happening, at least to us. To them, it made a lot more sense. 
But at first glance, it's a bit perplexing. And so what does it mean? What, it, what, what is God trying to tell them by telling them this story? It's actually quite simple. See, he is countering their question by illustrating the faithful remnant. See, the Lord is talking here about those who actually honored his name. Those who, in contrast to the ones who, who doubted and questioned and accused and remained there, those who, despite their circumstances and where they found themselves, remained faithful. They trusted. And it says that there is a day that is coming when the Lord will act. When, when you study this further, you, you realize this is the second coming of Christ. And in this moment, we see judgment play out. And there's a, a, a dividing, there's a distinction between the wicked and the righteous. And it says that the wicked will, will be set ablaze, that they will become stubble, meaning they will be reduced to ashes, and not a root or branch will be left to them. But for you who remain trusting in me, who revered my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its, in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed cows. See, he's countering their question by illustrating the faithful remnant, reminding them that he will return and he has not forgotten them. Reminding them that he will return and that he has not forgotten them. See, this is both a solemn warning and a hopeful promise. That's what this right here is. A solemn warning and a hopeful promise. A promise to those who remained, who feared the Lord and honored his name. And yet a solemn warning for those who opposed God, who spoke harshly and had lost hope, who had given up faith in him. See, to them, destruction awaited. And while seemingly harsh and perhaps a little bit intense, I mean, I don't know if you could imagine just hearing this, being like, God, are you worth following him? Are, are you worth following? And then he tells you this story of how at the end of the age, you know, those who don't follow him will be destroyed and those who do will be blessed. While it's perhaps intense, there's beauty in this moment. And this is what I really want to focus on tonight. See, God, in illustrating the day to come, was giving the Israelites an opportunity, an opportunity to repent. See, as he told this story, they began to see where they really were and where their faith stood. And so they became aware of the fact that if they continued in that way, there would be judgment. See, hardship and heartache can often reveal the state of our hearts. I'll say that again. Hardship and heartache can often reveal the state of our hearts. It's often in suffering where our faith is tested and where we're able to see where our faith truly lies. Martin Luther King put it this way. He said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. See, the Israelites, they, they had returned from exile. The temple was being built. And for them in that moment, it was comfortable and convenient. God was doing what he said he would do. And so it was easy to trust God. It was easy to say that our faith, our hope, what we believe is in God. But then, then, when things started to not go their way, when the other people around them were blessed, when those who were wicked began to prosper, then all of a sudden, they began to what? Question God. They began to question God. See, hardship and heartache will reveal the state of our hearts. 
It's easy to say, God, I trust you. God, I believe in you. God, I'm going to follow you when things are going well, when things are going our way, when we're prospering. But then when things go wrong and when our friends succeed and they're not honoring God, then our faith wavers. And see, this was the beauty of God, that he perhaps allowed them to walk through this so that they could see that their faith was not really where they thought it was. So that they could see that their faith was not where they really thought it was. See, we follow a God, we, we, we ascribe to a kingdom that is different than the world around us. It's what I, I call, or, or some have written, even John Mark Comer has said before, the values of an upside down kingdom. We see it all throughout scripture. The first shall be last. The greatest shall be the least. God's anger is perhaps his mercy. And I would present this thought today that perhaps suffering, hardship, and heartache is God's grace to show us where our faith truly is. I'm not saying that God ordained it. I'm not saying that God commanded it. But I'm saying that perhaps through it, God's grace to us would be that we could see where our faith truly lies. See, the Israelites may not have known the depth of their mistrust had it not been for the hardship they experienced and encountered. See, perhaps more than a hindrance, it was an opportunity, God's grace, allowing them to see where their faith truly was, and not just to know, but to repent. See, as I began tonight, God's heart, as we see all throughout Malachi, interwoven through the different questions and the different parts of, of Malachi, you, you, you see that his heart, God's heart, is to restore and renew his people. God didn't want to just tell them what they were doing wrong. God didn't just want to point out their shortcomings or their failures. God wanted to reveal to them the areas where they had failed and sinned and fallen short so that they would draw to God. Yet, it's not simply enough to know this it's through partnership that it happens. See, in knowing what was to come, as Jesus would soon enter the scene, this is the last book in the Old Testament. These are the last words before we, we shift over and Jesus enters the scene. God was calling them to repent, to recognize their shortcomings and their need for God. And so as we see in Malachi, how we wait matters to God. How we wait matters to God. In between the giving of the promise and the fulfillment of the promise matters. To close, we'll go to Malachi chapter four. It says this. Remember the law of my servant Moses. The decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. See, in the last part of the book, God is showing them how to prepare for the day of the Lord. God is showing them how to anticipate his coming because to him, the in-between matters because to him, the waiting matters. And to him, he wants to bring about renewal. But hear this tonight, Tehila. God's renewal, no matter how much you pray, no matter how much you hope for it, no matter how much you ask for it, no matter what you do, will not come without repentance. 
God's renewal won't come without repentance. We can pray and we can ask, God, would you renew my heart? Would you, would you renew uh, my community, my friends, my family? But if you don't repent, the renewal that he intends and he desires to bring to you won't happen unless you repent. See, throughout this book, we, we, we realize that God's heart is to renew. And so it makes sense that at the very end, God would show this picture calling them to repent. Because if they accepted what he offered, what he showed them, if they repented, then renewal would come. There's two points to this last part. And to draw this to our context today. See, for them, Jesus had not yet entered the scene. But yet, while this prophecy spoke to a prophet who would come, that would be John the Baptist, he would prepare the way, they still, and to us still, sorry, the, the day of the Lord has not happened. And so there's still time. And so although we're on the other side of Jesus, we like them are still waiting for the second coming of the Lord. And so these points of what Malachi offers them apply to us as well. That as we wait for the second coming of Christ, that as we wait for that day when he will bring justice and he will renew all things, as we wait for that day, this is what he gives us. Prepare by this, by one, remaining in his word. And two, prepare through repentance. One, remaining in in his word. You know, when circumstances are difficult and life is hard, it can be easy for us to draw away from God, but stay, stay close to his word because it'll remind you of who he is. It'll remind you of his character. It'll remind you of what he's done. I've, I've heard this before. I don't know if, oh yeah, it's right here. The divine gift of scripture is this. They point us to the past in order to inspire hope for the future. The divine gift of scripture is this. They point us to the past in order to inspire hope for the future. See, as we're in God's word, we're reminded of who he is and his truth. And so we don't forget. We don't get caught up in our questions. We don't become consumed by the present. And so remain in his word. If you want to spiritually prepare, if you want to be ready, if you want to anticipate the second coming of Christ, if you want to see renewal happen, remain in his word. And two, repent. I'm going to invite the band back up as I close. As I mentioned, God's renewal won't come without repentance. See, there may be some in here, a few, a few many who, like the Israelites, have accused God and lost faith in him. Perhaps the suffering in our world has become unbearable. Perhaps your experience has caused you to become hardened as you felt heartache and hardship, and so you've lost faith along the way. Perhaps we're not as different from the Israelites in this moment as we might think. See, they probably thought they had it all together. They probably thought they were blessed because of their faith. They probably thought that, you know, their, their faith was strong. Only to find out that God was warning them of judgment. That if they weren't careful, if they didn't repent, they would be reduced to ash. See, if I'm honest, I've found myself here lately. If I'm honest with you guys, I'm learning this right now in my own life. I'm not saying that I've stopped believing in God. 
Don't hear what I'm not saying. Some of you guys are worried. Someone in the chat is already putting up a link, praying for me. I, I haven't lost faith in God. But I'll be real with you. The last few months for me have been hard. Not in a, a, a crazy way, but just life. It's been difficult. There's been hardship. There's been heartache. And in the midst of it, I've realized myself that perhaps my faith isn't what I fully thought it was. You know, here I am, this pastor, a, a faith leader, and I've, I've created this, this idea of faith in my mind that I have, that, that I'm subscribed to. And then hardship and heartache comes, not even the worst of it. There's so much more difficult out there than what I've experienced. And all of a sudden, I start questioning God. I start accusing God. I become preoccupied with those questions. I lose sight of who he is. And it's not to put guilt or shame on myself or any others, but I've found that perhaps what I've gone through was a blessing in disguise to show me that there's a lot more in me that needs to grow, to show me that there's a lot more in me that actually needs strengthening and building a stronger foundation that the Lord wants to lay in my life for what he wants to do both in me and through me. And I wonder if I didn't go through that, would I have known? Would I have kept going along thinking, oh, you know what, I'm a pastor. Oh, you know what, I've been in ministry for so many years. I've got it together. I believe God. Nothing can break that foundation. Nothing can shake my faith. Would I have been okay thinking that? Probably. But as I experience what I've experienced, it's taught me something. I got a lot more to grow. I'm not really where I thought I was. But God, thank you. Thank you for showing me. I don't understand really why I had to experience what I experienced or why I had to go through what I had to go through. But I do know this. It's taught me something about myself and about you. And if I truly want to see you renew my life, if I truly want to see you move in, in, in the ways that I've heard and dreamed and, and prayed for, then I got to repent. And would that repent draw me to even greater faith? So I don't know exactly what you're going through today, what you've gone through this week or this last month. But I can imagine that parts of it have not been easy. That parts of it have probably been hard. And I imagine that if you're in this room, there's probably some sort of spirituality or faith you have. And so you've probably questioned and asked God, are you real? God, are you there? God, are you good? I imagine that like me, if you've seen the news anytime recently or if you've scrolled through Instagram anytime today, you've probably seen a lot of destruction. You've probably seen a lot of division, a lot of brokenness. And you begin to wonder and you begin to question and again, I'm not saying that God has ordained these things or God has put these things in place. But what I am saying is that perhaps our perspective might be jaded, that we run from this, we avoid this, we, we, we blame God when it happens instead of seeing it as an opportunity, instead of seeing it as his grace to reveal what's truly inside of us and what truly lies at the core of our heart. And so my hope is that even if we don't understand why or why, why it doesn't make sense, that we would still trust him. My hope is that if you're going through hardship, that if you're questioning God, you would know, hey, that's all right. As I said at the beginning, he's not afraid and it's not wrong. But would you know this? Don't get so caught up in it that it consumes you. Be careful. 
That's what Malachi was telling the people here. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Because if you stay there, this is what will happen. And it's not a pretty sight. But this is his love showing us these things so that we would know. That we would know that he is a just God. That he is good. That he cares. That he sees. That he knows. And the day will come. It will come. Don't forget that. It will come when he will make all things new. And he will make everything right. It might not be perfect now. It might be far from it. But this isn't the end. And so don't let this define God for you. Don't let your circumstance right now define who God is forever. So tonight, the invitation is simple. The invitation is this, that we would posture ourselves before him, that we would draw to his word. And perhaps for some of us, as we evaluate and we take some time to look inside of ourselves, we would repent. See that the Bible defines repentance as a change of mind or attitude to turn away from one's sins. If we want to see God's renewal, our first must be repentance. If you want to see God renew the areas of your heart that feel tired and weak, if you want to see God renew the, the, the parts of your heart that have begun to doubt and, and worry, if you want to see God's renewal in our community, in our city, in our world, first, we must repent. And I realize this, I'm not going to answer every question. There's a lot of questions out there. But what I do know is this, that perhaps like Malachi, there was lots of questions, but he focused on one thing, who God is. And so tonight, will we focus on him? I'm going to invite you to stand as we close. I want us to take a moment, just even in your, your own space right now, to begin to ask God, God, what, what are the areas that you wanna renew? Perhaps even as you've been hearing already, you're like, man, I've become so preoccupied with the present that I forgot who you are. I've lost sight of your presence. I've doubted you, I've accused you, and I let it stay there rather than drawing back to your word Just take a moment, begin to ask. Perhaps I've, I've run from suffering, hardship and heartache and, I, and I've missed the opportunity within it to see where my faith truly is. Don't miss that chance tonight. Don't miss this moment, Tehillah. Because the reality is, if we do, we'll pay the price. We'll pay the price. So take a moment. Just invite his Holy Spirit in. Perhaps you've prayed for renewal. Maybe for the first time, for the 12th time, and you desire it and you want it. Well, first, we have to repent of our sins, of our shortcomings, and our failure. On the screen, you'll see Psalms 51 in a moment. Let's take another 30 seconds.
You know, I believe, I believe this is David. I don't know. I could be wrong. It is. Okay. Sweet. Thank you. Thanks, Pastor James. <laughs> I believe that David understood what God or what what God was saying through Malachi. Because I believe this part of scripture, this what he's saying is actually stepping into that to repent in order to renew. And so I believe that this is a prayer that God wants to put on our hearts tonight. I'm gonna read it out and then you can begin to just speak it over yourself if you'd like. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. See, this is also the beauty of God, that he doesn't just wanna work in you for your sake, he wants to work in you for the sake of others. See, God, I repent. God, create a pure heart, renew me, restore me, so that I will teach others your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Renewal in our city, renewal across this room, renewal in your family will set a blaze if it starts in you. If it starts in you. So wherever you're at tonight, Tehila, maybe you're like me and you've gone through some hardship and heartache and you realize your faith is not really where you thought it was. That's okay. There's an opportunity tonight to repent and to come before him, to lay everything at his feet and to say, God, would you create a pure heart in me? Would you renew me and restore me so that you could just, so not only you could bring renewal to me, but that you could bring renewal to those around me as well. So I'm gonna pray, the band's gonna play, and then we're gonna close off for tonight. I invite you just even now, I just feel like His Holy Spirit is moving in the room, drawing people towards repentance. And I just feel like this verse keeps coming to mind. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I feel like some of you feel like you're chained to this. Some of you feel shame and guilt and, and, and you blame yourself. And God says, no, I wanna bring joy. Where my Spirit is, there is freedom. And so step into that with confidence and boldness, not shame or guilt. And so God, tonight we just pray. God, would we not become so preoccupied with the present that we lose sight of your presence, that we lose perspective, God. God, if we have, we repent. God, if we allowed our circumstances to define you, if we allowed a moment to, to tell who you are, then, then we repent, God. God, as you showed us tonight and as you showed the people of Israel, there will be a day when you will make things right. There will be a day when you will come and you will renew and you will restore and you will redeem. There will be a day when we not forget, but when we trust in you, even now. And if we've lost trust, if we lost faith, then we repent. And so God, we pray for renewal. God, we believe that this is what your heart is for us, to renew us, to renew your people, to renew all things. And so we wanna step into that, God. But first we repent. 
for our sins, for our shortcomings, for our failures, for where we fail to trust you, for where we fail to see you, for we fail to hold on to you. And not in guilt and in shame, but in trust, knowing in full joy that, God, there is freedom that is about to come. And so, God, we thank you for what you're doing tonight. We thank you for your spirit. God, I pray that your spirit would just move across this room, that you would draw us to you, that this prayer would be our prayer, that, God, we would go from here not the same but different, that we would go from here not just renewed within ourselves but seeking to renew the places that you've placed us in. And so, God, we thank you for what you're doing. God, I thank you for this people. And God, I thank you that we will not see a day where we need to be worried of, that, of, of judgment, but we can have joy knowing that we trusted and had faith in you. In Jesus' name, we all prayed. Amen.